Good evening and thank you for joining us. After more than 48 hours without power, thousands of Hydro One customers in the rural areas north and west of Thunder Bay finally had their service restored today. About 2,000 people are still waiting, however, as line crews continue working to repair the damage from Wednesday's snowstorm. Snapped hydro poles and broken trees falling onto power lines led to about 34,000 Hydro One customers losing power on Wednesday. The outage extended through Thursday and into today. This video shows flames and sparks coming from a downed power line near Mud Lake Road. The utility had to rally all of its resources as over 250 Hydro One workers were called in from other areas like Dryden, Kenora and Timmins to help with the repairs. Hydro One spokesperson Alicia Sayers says they're confident nearly all of the remaining outages should be resolved by midnight tonight. Yeah, so it's been, uh, you know, all hands on deck, like I said, and our focus is to get power on for our customers. And our map is refreshed every 10 minutes as information comes in from our crews on the ground. And we are anticipating that all customers will have their power restored by today. The township of Gillies declared a state of emergency after entering a third day without power. Reeve Wendy Wright says teams of volunteers went door to door and fortunately there were no medical emergencies. Meanwhile, the Nolaloo Community Center is being used as a warming center and Wi-Fi hub for anyone in the area who still doesn't have power. The 2022 federal budget that was released yesterday is garnering mixed reviews here in the Northwest. Big ticket items like mining support are being given a thumbs up from business leaders and opposition members. But the lone conservative MP in this region isn't a fan of the deficit topping $50 billion. Corey Nordstrom has more. There's certainly some positives and negatives, I think, in the, in the budget. Thunder Bay Chamber of Commerce President Sharla Robinson said she was expecting more funds directly tied to helping the hospitality sector rebound from the COVID-19 pandemic. They've been really hit hard and we sort of hoped that there would be a continuation of the hardest hit funding programs past uh, you know, the, the current deadline and that hasn't been announced. So disappointed that that extension hasn't been announced uh, in this budget. The 2022 budget is more prudent than many expected, coming in with a deficit of $52.8 billion, less than half of last year's. But Kenora Conservative MP Eric Malillo sees it as only baby steps towards a balanced budget, which the Liberals don't come close to achieving until 2027. There's currently no plan uh, to get back to balance uh, uh, with this budget. And that's despite the fact that the parliamentary budget officer has stated that uh, the need for stimulus uh, is, is no longer there, that ju the justification is gone. And we, uh, you know, I'm concerned because uh, we know that this spending is going to drive up inflation and drive up the cost of living. A bright spot for both Melillo and Robinson was the investment into mining. Canada is committing $3.8 billion for the exploration and procurement of critical minerals. I think that's going to be positive for our region because of there's so many projects that are sort of sitting on the cusp of being ready. Minister Patty Haidu points out that her government has also pledged $4.3 billion over seven years to improving Indigenous housing. There's a critical shortage of housing on First Nations and for First Nations people off reserve as well. Um, the North is an, an acute area. Many people have talked about the, the, the sparsity of housing in really far North uh, communities. So this is, uh, I think, an ambitious plan to build houses um, as aggressively as we can. The Indigenous Services Minister is also anticipating a dozen of the 34 boil water advisories in First Nations to be lifted in the next year, as they're adding $247 million for water and wastewater systems. It's all a part of $10.6 billion for Indigenous initiatives. Corey Nordstrom, TBT News. Another person in our district has died with COVID-19. It's the 85th COVID-related death since the pandemic began. Meanwhile, the number of COVID patients at the Regional Health Sciences Centre has dipped below 20 once again. There are now 19 cases inside the hospital, down from 21 on Thursday. Eight of those patients are in intensive care. That number is unchanged. The hospital occupancy rate now sits at 105% while the occupancy rate in the ICU is at nearly 91%. The Thunder Bay District Health Unit is reporting 55 new COVID cases since its last update on Wednesday. There are now 127 known active cases across the district. 
and there are no case numbers for the Northwestern Health Unit today. The NWHU now only provides updated figures once a week on Wednesdays. The Northern Ontario Caucus for the Provincial NDP will present a motion on Monday that aims to save Northerners money at the pumps. The MPPs will call on the Ford government to provide $200 gasoline rebates for all Northern households. This comes after the massive jump in prices, including here in Thunder Bay. Many stations on the south side of the city are still at more than $1.95 a litre, while many gas bars on the north side are now around $1.87. Thunder Bay Atacokan MPP Judith Monteith Farrell spoke in favor of the proposed gas rebate and called the Conservatives' recent gas savings initiative an empty promise. Put your money where your mouth is. If you really want to provide relief, don't make a promise before an election and then uh, who knows what will happen down the road. In that legislation that the Ford government has put forward, there is no guarantee that anyone is going to receive any money. Uh, from the writing I'm from, I know that... Uh... Uh, the cost of living and also the, the cost of fuel it can be horrendous uh, because uh, we don't have access to provincial highways like uh, everyone else. The motion will be brought forward and discussed on Monday at Queen's Park. The Balmoral Street reconstruction project is about to move into its final stage. The city is now calling for bids for the work between Alloy Drive and Beverly Street. A site visit was held yesterday to provide more information to potential contractors looking to take on the estimated eight to nine million dollar project. Design drawings and the tender materials were discussed and contractors asked questions to better understand what's required. The Balmoral reconstruction was announced seven years ago and the sections between the McIntyre River and Alloy Drive are already finished. City project engineer Mike Vogrig explains what drivers can expect once the reconstruction is complete. It's going to be very similar to uh, the previous stages we've done. Uh, so this stage is obviously a, a lot longer. It's about 1.6 kilometers. Uh, we're, we're going all the way from where we left off to uh, Beverly. Uh, but it's same, same kind of idea. We're going to be filling in the ditches and putting in storm sewer, uh, putting uh, three meter wide multi-use trails on each side of the road. Uh, and doing all the repairs we need in the meantime to underground infrastructure while we do that. The project will also include the reconstruction of the intersection at Central Avenue. The tender will close soon and the winning bid will have to be approved by City Council. In a little over two months, residents of Marathon will enter into a new stage of connectivity following TVTEL's latest fibre network expansion. The $6.5 million project is a collaboration between the municipality and the utility. Officials gathered in Marathon this week to celebrate the initiative. Adam Riley has the details. In recent years, T-Baytel has brought its fiber network to communities in the west, including Fort Francis, Dryden and Kenora. Now the company is expanding that connectivity to the east. President Dan Topatai says the $6.5 million project came through a collaborative approach with the municipality, which was a critical element for the telecom provider. They were essential in making sure that we can uh, have a successful project here, along with uh, higher levels of government. Provincial funding for this project was essential to be able to allow us, but we've also made a multi-million dollar investment in the community and uh, we, we think it's going to pay off. Marathon Mayor Rick Dumas says he's happy and proud to see a regional company make an expanded investment in the community. Discussions to bring fibre to the North Shore began in 2018, with the installation of the network taking place last summer. Well, and that's one of the things that our council has always been successful at, is looking at strategic planning, and our plan is to, uh, was to introduce the high, high speed fiber to our community, and that was the onset of our, one of our strategic plan goals, and here we are in 22, and having that going to be completed, so it's one of those check marks in our community that we've addressed. We've uh, provided the services through a partnership, and uh, you know the, the residents got to be pleased with that. In addition to the fiber network, t -Tel is also expanding its physical footprint to the region with the first t -Tel store outside of Thunder Bay, allowing residents to access products and services without having to travel or use a third-party distributor. And Topatai says this latest announcement is just the beginning. We decided to uh, do our build in a multi-phased approach. Uh, we took Marathon first and uh, we are currently in the process of uh, engineering and we'll be building later this year into uh, Terrace Bay as well. That work is expected to be completed and operational next year. Adam Riley, TBT News. What does grief look like? A new photography ex exhibition at the Thunder Bay Art Gallery will try to answer that question. 
Hospice Northwest invited 18 artists, most of them local, to express their experience of grief through photography. The exhibit is called A Personal Lens on Grief. Special events, including two grief workshops, will be held later this month. Event organizers Sherry Koch and Claudia Otto note that grief can't always be put into words, and they hope that through this exhibit, visitors will find new ways to express themselves with art and movement. Uh, somebody coming um, uh, as a guest to see this art show can also experience um, the fact that it's okay to experience uh, feeling a hole in their heart or not feeling complete or feeling isolated and alone as they will read and see in these pictures that it's okay to not be okay in your grief. What they have done, it's like maybe you and I journaling. Okay, it's like holding up your journal so that everybody could see it. So it's one of the things I feel in this room is their courage. I mean, yes, there's the pain, but it takes a lot of courage, and I also see a lot of hope. The official launch and opening ceremony are scheduled for 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. The Thunder Bay Museum is hosting a special exhibit that focuses on the Holocaust and the survivors who came to Canada. Local organizers hope it will help local residents better understand the history and draw lessons that can be applied today. Lee Noonan reports. And in 1948, I Came to Canada is a touring exhibit from the Montreal Holocaust Museum commemorating survivors and looking at their journeys to Canada and the Jewish immigrant experience. Additional artifacts and information have been added to reflect the specific history of the Jewish community in Thunder Bay. Scott Bradley, executive director of the Thunder Bay Museum, says the exhibit is for everyone, but they particularly hope to see younger people attending. It will be always eminently important to teach, especially young people, our leaders and our educators um, about everything that went on, the causes, how we got there and the, you know, the social environment, the, pol the political environment that led to, the, led to genocide, especially in the case of the Holocaust, um, and how we can make sure that we put in the protections to have that never happen again. The museum partnered with Sharei Sharaim Congregation of Thunder Bay to host the exhibit. The congregation's president, Daniel Hanna, says the local Jewish community is small but active and showed overwhelming support for the exhibit, raising donations and even loaning family heirlooms. You know, I think community members thought that it would be really helpful to have an educational tool on the Holocaust available to people in Thunder Bay, um, that it filled a gap that didn't, you know, wasn't being met at this moment by educational resources or museum resources currently in the city. Um, People think it's still relevant to talk about the Holocaust, to talk about racism, to talk about genocide, to talk about the dangers of totalitarian government at this particular moment. An opening reception is planned for this coming Monday at 7 p.m. Registration for the reception and other special events is available on the Thunder Bay Museum website. Special events include two guest speakers and a concert series featuring works by Jewish composers affected by the Holocaust. The exhibit will be running from now until July 24th. Lee Noonan, TBT News. Well, Fiona, it looks like things are starting to dry out there. 